Good morning, everybody. Am I audible? Yeah, thank God for air conditioning. It's hot outside and we get to sit over here. And um, I'm not quite sure if I would meet your expectations. I am not quite sure what you have in mind about money. Uh, if you think you're going to end up going from here, growing your money, I'm not quite sure if that's going to happen. Uh, but um, let's hear what I believe God has spoken to me. And the scripture reading that uh, I would be reading for you today is taken from the gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 6, verses 24 to 34. I would say St. Matthew, chapter 6, verses 24 to 34. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or... You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or even what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Can we just close our eyes? And pray. Dear Father, as I bring forth your word to your people this morning, help us to be attentive to the prompting of your Holy Spirit and enable us to understand the depths of your word in a way that it transforms us into the liking of your Son, our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Bless both the reading and the listening of your word. Amen. In light of today's scripture reading, I have chosen to title my sermon, You Cannot Serve Both God and Mammon. I repeat that, you cannot serve both God and Mammon. Let me start by sharing a bit of a story. Perhaps you can uh, call it a parable of one sense. So there was once a newly married couple where the wife was very pretty and wealthy. The wife loved the husband a lot. She began a very wealthy, she belonged to a very wealthy family who lacked nothing and owned almost everything in the town. She provided for all of his expenses and provided for all of his needs. She told her husband that every year on their anniversary, as an expression of his love for her, what she would appreciate is for him to buy her a new sari. The husband gladly agrees to this. As time passed, the husband started looking at another woman who appeared more beautiful and started having an extramarital engagement with her. Nevertheless, every year on their anniversary, he would go buy her an expensive sari and present it to her. Soon, the husband started losing interest in even going to shop and looking for the sari and ordered just any cheap sari online and gave it to his wife. 
Soon he distanced himself from the wife completely, but every year he would continue to buy her a sari. One day she confronted him. If he still loves her, since she, she confronted him, if, she, if he still loves her, because she started noticing that the quality of the saris that he was buying was deteriorating over time. He denied and pointed to the fact that all she did was ask for a sari, and this is what he was doing faithfully year after year. Then one day she got upset and blocked all his finances. He asked for forgiveness, realizing that he was not getting all the perks anymore. She forgave, and he again in some time had another affair. This is a story of Israel. What do you think in this story? The woman or the wife and the husband. What represents God and what re represents Israel? But this is also a story of so many Christians. For some, this is a story week after week. Attending church, paying tithes, participating in other giving and church activities like Bible reading, singing songs. For such people, buying, doing these things is like buying a sari. And the sad reality is they think this is good enough. Now let's keep this story in the background and move on to the gospel leading up to the chapter 6 to 24 to 34. The gospel according to St. Matthew is most likely believed to have been written between 66 and 73 AD. The audience or the intended audience is the Jewish community for whom the temple had fallen down for the second time. And this was in the period of 70 AD around. The first temple was destroyed in 586 BC and Israelites found themselves abandoned. And now again, the second time, the temple had fallen down. In the gospel, Matthew presents Jesus as a fulfillment of the law of the Old Testament and not as a contradiction to it. He does this by connecting Jesus to Abraham and to David and even more so he reveals Jesus as the awaited Messiah of Israel. You can find this in the, story, in the genealogy of chapter 1 verse 1 where it says the book of the genealogy of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. There are a lot of Jewish connotations in this gospel like the number 14 as the number of generations found in 1 verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until Christ are 14 generations. Matthew further points to Joseph as the father of Jesus as someone who is a just man, but also someone who is faithful to the law. And you can find that in chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. But I will read out verse 23. It says, Behold, the virgin shall be with a child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And we know in these verses that Joseph, being a just man, when he got to know that Mary was expecting, without him knowing her, he wanted to you know, step away quietly. Matthew wants to highlight Joseph as a just person, be, but also as a person according to the law, who holds the law. Yeah. Let's move forward. Note that Matthew in initially Matthew is initially including the text 123 and pointing to the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah 714, 
Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The narrative moves from Jesus presented as Emmanuel and son of David in chapter 1 to Jesus as the Messiah who is going to be the awaited king of Jews and is visited by the Magi in chapter 3, chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of Jews? Furthermore, in the chapter, the escape of Egypt and the return to Nazareth points to prophetic fulfillment that he will be called a Nazarene. You can find that in Matthew chapter 2 verses 19 to 23. And let me read verse 23. And he came, dwelt in the city called Nazareth, that he might be fulfilled, he might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Note, a God is a God of his word. If he brings to pass what he has spoken to the prophets, how much more? will he bring to pass his direct words to us, which he himself has spoken. Note that Matthew is very intentionally tying fragments of the Old Testament in terms of prophecies about Jesus as the Messiah as he is speaking, or rather writing to a Jewish audience. Now moving to chapter 3, Matthew points to John the Baptist as the voice of the one calling in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord, as stated by prophet Isaiah in chapter 40 verse 3 yet another Old Testament prophecy the brief interaction of John with the Pharisee and the Sadducee further points out that Jesus the one who will baptize with Holy Spirit and fire implying that Jesus is superior to John the Baptist and John the Baptist uh, in um, chapter 3 verse 11 it says I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Also, the presence of the divine during the baptism event of Jesus introduces Jesus as the Son of God. Chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew, moving on to chapter 4, points to Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, his temptation experience with an intent that the Jewish readers will connect it to the 40 years of wilderness journey of the Israelites. The contrast being that Israelites failed, but Jesus did not give in to temptation. Furthermore, Matthew briefly introduces the onboarding of the disciples and the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, where he preaches about the kingdom of heaven and heals every disease and sickness amongst the people. Reference chapter 4, verse 23. Amongst his other miracles is Jesus delivering the demon-possessed and the paralyzed people. He walks on water and even calms the storm at Galilee. All these implying his divine nature of Jesus. Jesus has authority even over nature. Both wind and waves obey him. Now once Matthew establishes Jesus as the Messiah, which Israel has long been waiting for, he then moves on to chapter 5, 6, and 7. This is what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is teaching at the mount to both his disciples and to the larger crowd who gathered around him is something what people have never heard or even thought of before. No scribes or any religious leader before Jesus had thought with such an authority and conviction. People were astonished. Jesus seems to redefine the classical Jewish understanding of what God's reign looks like. And people are surprised and to know what means to be blessed or 
who according to God are blessed people. No one has ever heard such an exposition about the kingdom of God earlier. Till now the classical understanding of blessed people seemed to be pointing to the ones who had got it all. Wealth, happiness, power, abundance. People who were well established seemed to be the ones who were blessed. Or at least people thought these were the ones who were blessed. Often such people had a hint of arrogance and pride in them and enjoyed a certain privilege, security in the society. For the Jews, it meant wealth, power, land, reflecting prosperity. And to some extent, they were not wrong. As Yahweh himself had promised them all these things if they were obedient to the Mosaic law. However, their disobedience led to their captivity and exile and the rule of foreign kings over them resulted in the loss of all the privileges which they once enjoyed. A lot similar to the story I shared in the beginning about the rich wife and the husband. And this is why they were waiting for the promised Messiah who would overthrow the Roman Empire and bring them back into power where they can once again enjoy what they had lost because of their disobedience to the law. You can read about this in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 33 to chapter 6 verse 3. Note, people were waiting for the Messiah for their personal welfare and not for their love for God. Now, isn't it true for some of us today? We wait upon God not because we love him, but because we want something from him. Let's move forward. In such a backdrop of expectations, here is Jesus teaching people that the ones that are blessed are the ones who are poor in spirit, the ones who mourn, the meek ones, the ones who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the ones who show mercy, the ones who are pure in heart, the ones who choose peace over conflict, the ones who are persecuted because they uphold righteousness over wickedness, the ones who are insulted, persecuted, and falsely accused because of him. For such, Jesus asked them to rejoice and be glad because great is their reward in heaven. You might want to read Psalm 37 and Job 21, 7 to 17, perhaps later. At times when we look around us, it does seem like the righteous are suffering and the wicked are prospering. Both Psalm 37 and the Beatitude Sermon on the Mount is God's response to this. Jesus is the Messiah who resonates with the suffering of his people because he himself suffered even to his death and was buried and resurrected the third day. He no longer suffers and the hope we have in him is that one day there will be an end to the wickedness and righteousness and justice shall prevail. The dead in Christ will also, like Christ, rise up. And within this narrative is woven the greatest story of salvation, what we understand as the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us move forward. Note that Jesus seems to indicate to his audience a certain kind of a shift. The place of reward, the nature of reward, and the condition laid down for the reward has shifted. According to Jesus, the law is the same, but the benchmark has been raised. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The promised place is no longer Canaan. The promised people are no longer restricted to the Israelites alone. And the conditions is no longer adherence to the old standards or the understanding of the law. 
Earlier, the Pharisees were considered among the Jews as ones who represented the benchmark for everyone to aspire to. But now the righteousness is, doesn't even meet the cut. Now their righteousness doesn't even meet the cut. To qualify one would have to now surpass that. Note what Jesus means is that the entrance into the kingdom is by righteousness of the heart and not by the hypocritical or external legalism. I would repeat that note. What Jesus means is that the entrance into the kingdom is by righteousness of the heart and not by a hypocritical or external legalism. According to the new prescribed standard, anyone who is angry with the brother and sister will be subjected to judgment. A person who calls another worthless is answerable in the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of fire of hell. You can read more about it in chapters 5 and 6. So what exactly is Jesus getting to? All this while the Pharisees and the scribes were teaching and taking pride in flawlessly adhering to the external aspect of the law. And this is why Jesus elsewhere calls them a hypocrite. Jesus' teaching shifts the focus on the intent of the law and not the letter or the external action of the law. In other words, the heart of the action matters more than the action itself. I will repeat that. The heart of the action matters more than the action itself. Love ought to be the governing factor for all the actions. Else it is all meaningless. Love ought to be the governing factor for all the actions. Else it is all meaningless. And if, in fact, the above holds true, then love seems to be the foundation. It makes perfect sense why Jesus later, in chapter 22, verse 36 to 40, responds to the question asked by the Pharisee, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus answers, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Note that Jesus very aptly intertwines loving God and loving his people together. And all this while, the foundation of the law had always been love and nothing else. But over generations, sadly, the Israelites never understood this truth. They only focused on the externals and not the intent of the law. By the time Jesus walked this earth as a person, his own people thought that he is teaching something else apart from the law. They even crucified him, but in all of Jesus' ministry, his focus was love about everything else. It is in the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus that the story of Israel comes into its fullness and not in the law of Moses. The Messiah of Israel that was awaited to set them free from the burden of the law and sin and lead them into everlasting life, everlasting riches, and everlasting blessings. So it's no longer local or restricted, but these blessings have gone to eternal. And that place is not in this temporal life the land that the Israelites were promised at one point of time. But the place now 
is in the life which is yet to come. Jesus was wanting people to seek for God's kingdom to establish within their hearts more than anything else. And if they would do that, then the Father would provide everything they need and even more, just like he did with the Israelites in the past. Moving forward, Matthew records Jesus' emphasis on the need to focus on enduring eternal treasures as compared to uncertain temporal nature of earthly treasures, which breeds anxiety and extreme greed. Note that Jesus is not against material things, but is leaning towards selfish and extravagant materialism. I will repeat that. Note that Jesus is not against material things, but the leaning towards selfish and extravagant materialism that he's against of. 1, Matthew, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. In chapter 6 and verse 24, God is making a strong statement. You cannot serve God and mammon. It is clear that it is a case of either or and not this and that. For all of us, God will lead us on a road which reaches a junction where you either take left or right, where you either choose God or something else in your pursuit. The temptation is to find comfort and security in one's wallet or bank balance, and if so, then the natural desire is to move in that direction. Anything we pursue passionately soon has a hold on us. God wants us to pursue his righteousness and his kingdom. At times, he wants us to prove it with our wallets too, by investing our money to help his people. Both the ones who know him and even more so the ones who do not know him. But he wants us to do it not out of an obligation, but out of a genuine love for him, which is expressed by genuinely loving his people, genuinely caring for them, and even supporting his mission. Above all, by revealing him to the world, as the true and perfect Messiah. This morning, God may be leading you into being a blessing to someone in your family or friend or even to an acquaintance by meeting a need about which they have been praying to God. Would you honor God by trusting in him for your and your family's needs by sharing what you have with those who may need it more than what you do. Your giving to a child of God delights the Father's heart. Your giving to a child of God delights the Father's heart. Psalm 24, 1 verse 2 says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Just like this story, remember that everything the husband had and enjoyed was because the wife owned it and gave it to him. Even the sari that he bought for him, her, the money was the wife's. When you look at Matthew, he's, he's, he's not just using this, what Jesus spoke, 
with an intention that we can go home saying, okay, this is how much I need to tithe, this is how much I need to pay, should I save this, should I multiply this? You know, is it okay to invest, is it not okay to invest? But the crux is, what is the heart when it comes to money? What is the intention when it comes to money? Do we give to God with an intention that he will multiply and give it back to us? Are we like people who were Jews at one point of time, were Israelites, who only followed the externals so that they can receive the benefit? Or are we people who will choose to give to the Father for his cause because he expects us to love him and the way he expects us to love him by loving his people. If we say God is our father, and when Matthew says that a few verses earlier than chapter six, in chapter six, and he introduces to us what Jesus mentions as the Lord's prayer, and he says our father in heaven, our father is a collective representation of us being his children, and therefore a greater obligation on his children to look after another brother and sister in need. How often have we just found ourselves wanting to meet our own needs and how often have we looked around us who we can give, what we can give, what is it that we own that somebody else might need a little more than what we have a need for. And this is in one sense, when you look at the book of Matthew, Matthew is trying to take you up a mountain. He introduces Jesus as the Messiah to a Jewish audience. He's, he's slowly leading us into an idea that, okay, we can choose either God or money. You know, Eventually, he moves a little further where he talks about God or Jesus is sending us like sheep to the wolves. He's telling us that we cannot hold on to our own lives if we were to follow God. He leads us to the closure of it, you know, where it talks about the great commission that everybody has an obligation to. And that is to ensure that we receive and pass on God's teaching. He does not want us to only dwell on chapter 6. But this is just the beginning. And the beginning is you cannot have two masters in this journey ahead of you. But even more so, the thing that relieves us is when he says the Father in heaven is, knows what your needs are. He is redirecting our attention from our needs to what he wants us to do with an assurance that he is always aware of our needs and he will provide for that. And uh, yeah, this changes a lot of things about how we view money and what we want to do with money. I do understand that as parents, we would want to save up for our children. But it's very interesting with the death of Moses and the rising of Joshua, God says, just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. And I think if we can teach our children that, that even after us, your father in heaven will continue to be with you. And if we can teach our children that everything that we receive is from God and we have an obligation to give it back to him as an expression of our love and gratitude for what he does, realizing that it doesn't belong to us, that we are just stewards. And if we are stewards of certain things, then we should use this, what he has given, for his kingdom and not for our sake. God does not mean to say that if a husband, for example, wants to provide a certain expensive thing for his wife as a gesture of his love is something that he does not intend or does not approve of. But the larger truth over here is God does not tie any strings directly on how much to give. That was in Old Testament. 
today he expects to give out of love not out of the law because as we saw even the foundation of the law was love so maybe ask yourself do you love god enough with your wallet how has the past year been where have you spent more are we as sons and daughters of god are we investing in his kingdom because that is where his heart lies and that is where our heart needs to lie and it's more of an introspection rather than me or or the scripture telling you what you really need to do and where you need to spend how much you need to spend but if god is someone you love truly then god is where you will invest truly if that is not the case and i would only like to encourage you to once again like the sermon topic said you cannot serve two masters you have to choose between god or mammon you know with an assurance that if you choose god know that he owns everything know that he has you in his mind and somewhere else in the scripture it says i have never seen the righteous forsaken nor their children begging for bread be assured that if you invest in god's kingdom even your children will not be hungry but even in ministry there has never been a missionary dedicated his life who has died naked hungry you know god has taken care even in the midst of suffering so as i invite the worship team to come over here to lead, in, lead us into the final closing song may i once again encourage you to evaluate yourselves not necessarily by your words but even more so by your actions where have we spent most of our money knowing that it is not our money thank you <laughs>